Leadership. All my life, I've been fascinated by what makes a good leader. Are good leaders born or made? Can leadership be taught? How do leaders lead if people don't trust to even listen? I grew up in Arkansas. Now I live and work in the innovation heartland of Northern California. During these past years of constant crisis, I've thought more deeply about leadership and what it takes to lead people, especially when trust is in limited supply. That's why I decided to create this podcast and reach out to change makers from different disciplines to hear what they have to say. As the host of this show, the most important things I can do are two things I learned in medical school, to ask good questions and then listen. Hello, I'm Lloyd Miner, Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine, and welcome back to the Miner Consult. It's my privilege to welcome this week's guest, Schroeder Stribling. She is the president and CEO of Mental Health America, a leading national nonprofit that is dedicated to addressing mental illness and promoting overall mental health. A lifelong social justice advocate, Schroeder has more than two decades of experience in nonprofit leadership focusing on mental health, homelessness, and racial justice. Before taking the helm at Mental Health America, she was CEO of In Street Village, a Washington, D.C.-based organization offering a suite of vital services for homeless women. Her background is in social work, and her passion is improving the lives of society's most vulnerable. Thank you so much for joining me today, Schroeder. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. You've devoted your career to supporting the vulnerable and advocating for marginalized populations. What inspired you to take this path? Well, thank you, first of all, for that question. And for me, as I think for many, my passion really grew first out of my own personal lived experience and some of my early professional experiences. Um, I had a very formative early experience with my biological father, who was someone who came out later in life. Um, he divorced my mother and left his vocation as a minister to claim uh, the gay identity that he had been hiding for a long time. And unfortunately, he went on to struggle mightily with mental health and substance use issues, which led for him to some pretty dramatic consequences, including a suicide attempt and um, ultimately homelessness. Um, and then he died of AIDS when I was 21. I And I spent a lot of time with him, particularly in that l last part of his life. And after that, I got quite involved with AIDS activism and volunteering around AIDS. And I myself also came out in my late teen years. And so the LGBTQ community has really been home base in many ways for me since my young adulthood. And I would, I think that that following that formative experience, and I find this true when others talk about their path as well, that once awakened to injustice or discrimination in one place or one instance, my heart was really drawn to other social justice issues. So that's what ultimately led me down the path to pursue social work. And then I went on for many years to work with people with serious mental illness, which was became a great passion of mine. And then uh, in more recent years on to work in anti-poverty and racial justice work. And to me, those really are the two great social justice issues of our, of our time. Understood. You, as you mentioned, you're a, you're a social worker. You started your career as a social worker and were a social worker for many years. And then at In Street Village, you've seen firsthand what it's like for individuals who are, who are struggling with personal crises and what type of help is available to them or what type of help wasn't available for them. What did you observe and what lessons did you take away from that experience of leading In Street? At N Street Village, we served about 2,000 women every year with shelter, housing, drop-in programs, health care, mental health care, lots of wraparound services. And yes, as you say, the uh, women who came to N Street Village were struggling and usually in deep crisis. For one thing, poverty and homelessness was just the baseline. And then on top of that, many were struggling with mental health, substance use, 
or other health problems or were fleeing danger uh, or other forms of um, difficulty. And trauma was really a universal experience for the women that we served. And I know that that sounds like a sweeping statement, but I really came to believe it, whether that was uh, childhood or adult victimization or racial trauma, or simply the experience of the deprivations of poverty and the experience of homelessness, trauma was really everywhere. So we paid a great deal of attention to being a, a trauma-informed community. And what we knew at the village was that the most important thing we could offer any woman on any given day was her dignity. We held a commitment to reflect back to everyone that we saw that we, we honored their inherent worth and value, and we called our community a place of radical hospitality. Um, and for so many who people who have been ignored, often quite literally on the street ignored, or who've been marginalized or rejected from society in any way, being extended your due dignity is really of fundamental importance. Sometimes I think of it as belonging on the lowest rung of Maslow's hierarchy of need, um, as is inclusion and belonging. And that was the other thing that we could always offer. It was so important for those we served to have a place to go where they were known, where they were seen, where they were accepted, where they were greeted by name, where they were missed if they didn't, if we hadn't seen them in a while. Um, and one of the most remarkable things that I experienced and learned there was about the power of community. Our programs included recovery living centers and other supportive housing for people with addiction or mental health issues. And I had the honor of watching as these groups of people formed Chosen Family together. There were shared apartments of older women who would become a group of bickering best friends, or uh, there were recovery living residents who gave each other the motivation and the tough love and the relentless compassion that was necessary to pave their road to um, recovery. And when you ask about what's available for people, um, the good and the bad news is primarily there are places like N Street Village and our other peer nonprofit groups who provide the safety net of housing and services for people who are in need. And we did so in concert with the local government and with the philanthropic community. But the bottom line is that we, we cannot, and I mean this in the meta sense of we cannot and shouldn't rely on the charitable sector, so to speak, to solve poverty that there are systemic issues way beyond what nonprofits can address. And I think it reinforces our sense of bias and blame toward people living in poverty um, if we suggest that what's needed is um, simply charity as opposed to the, the social justice and new social compact we would need to alleviate poverty. So the bottom line was there was always a terrible backlog and a long wait for ultimate solutions. And the most fundamental ultimate solution for most people was housing because housing solves homelessness. So our shelters usually um, had close to 300 women um, staying each night and that wasn't unusual. So we have a ways to go. Indeed we do. I, I think it's useful for those of us in uh, healthcare and medicine to remember that, you know, 70 percent of the determinants of health are the social, environmental, and behavioral term determinants of health. The medical care we provide and our genetics accounts for maybe 20 to 30 percent of the determinants of health, but the vast majority are the determinants that, that you just mentioned. And I, it's very meaningful to me that you, you mentioned that the most important thing you could give uh, to the women you served at N Street Village was respect for an affirmation of their dignity. And I, I think that's so important for those of us involved in, in all aspects of health care uh, to remember uh, in our interactions with the people who come to us, who entrust their lives with us, and who look to us for support and help. So yeah. oh, over, the, over the course of your 17 years at N Street Village, you rose through the ranks to become CEO what did you learn about what it takes to lead effectively in the nonprofit space? 
Um, yes, I did. I, I was first at N Street Village as the program director, and then I became the CEO several years later. And that was my first experience as a CEO, having had a background in social work. I was really a novice in some ways to business leadership. And when I look back, I think perhaps my novitiate status was an asset. I think it made me, at least early on, bolder than I might have been if I uh, had uh, felt more constrained by more information, perhaps, um, or made me a little more creative in my imagination for what was possible. Um, so, uh, and definitely running a nonprofit is running a business. I know that there's oftentimes people don't um, assume that's the case, but it, it, indeed it's true. So in my first years of leadership there, in concert with a great board, I pursued a merger and acquisition strategy. And this was pretty uncommon in our sector and was a bold strategy. And we were pretty small and scrappy and without a big margin for error. But at the time, there was a lot of concern about um, a great number of smaller nonprofits who were faltering after the economic downturn of 2008. And we did not want to lose those resources in the community. And also, I was learning about the sheer number of small nonprofits and was becoming an advocate, which I still am, for, uh, for consolidation in the sector in general. So I learned a lot about gathering allies to embrace a bold strategy and marrying that with um, the urgency of, of a social mission. And I would say on a more tactical level, what I learned about leadership that's important to me is, first of all, and this is going to sound perhaps very uh, nerdy, uh, but uh, first of all, I really need a logic model. I need a clear understanding and articulation of what we are doing in this social mission and how we will know if it's working for the purpose we intend. So define the problem, plan the intervention, measure the results, and continually adjust and repeat. So that's very important to me to anchor myself with a, a theory of change or a logic model, as people call it. And equally important, what I, what I learned is, that, is how vitally important a strong leadership team is, especially a strong leadership team with high emotional intelligence. I really love teamwork and I, I rely on a team that um, of people who will always know more, I hope, about their particular areas and their expertise than I ever will. So nothing is done in isolation ever. And I find that a, a smart and zesty team working well together is, is uh, both a joy and a necessity. Um, I also learned a lot about the theory and, the, and had some practice with the notion of collective impact, bringing together allies and stakeholders from a wide variety of sectors and vantage points to address a very specific problem. This is an approach that's gotten some significant attention in, in our sector over the past decade plus, and I think it's an important improvement on our often uh, siloed activity or uh, approach. And I was proud to be part of a group that initiated a collective impact project on homelessness in DC in um, 2015. It, it's a complicated process and we made some modest progress, but it was significant. And I do think it also advanced our collaborative impulses, which was a good thing. That your description is so meaningful. How did you, as a leader, how did you you know, titrate the desire to have impact and so much need, you know, the desire to move forward, and I, and I suspect uh, a certain sense of restlessness because there was so much need, you know, balance that with, uh, with, with the challenges of you, you did mergers and acquisitions and uh, you were certainly bringing people together and, and, and building the shared mission. Uh, but did, how did how did you decide upon the pace, and what was that was that a challenge in terms of knowing where to push and where to uh, maybe uh, settle back and and wait for things to evolve? How how did that play out during your your years as CEO at In Street Village? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because you're right. There are so many demands, and you could look in almost any direction and name you know point your priority, and you'd be due north on a good thing. 
and you can't do more than you can do at, at, at one time. And certainly we did not get it right all the time. That is, that's for sure. And I think that's one of the things I certainly learned about leadership too, is that you move anyway and you'll get it wrong and that's okay. And you learn from it and you keep going. Um, I think it's really looking for those opening moments where, you, you know, a little thing could make a difference. When I mentioned the collective impact project, there was an opening moment when we saw an opportunity, a number of us colleagues saw an opportunity to institutionalize our local interagency council on homelessness and get our government and sector and nonprofit sector folks working together more tightly. So that's what we went for in that time. And when I say we had modest pro progress, maybe I should be more um, more emphatic. Maybe, um, but what we were able to establish an office and a, and a leader in the office and have that be funded on a not permanent ongoing basis. So that's an example of when we did get it right, when there was an opening and we went for something, but there were other times to when we had to say, let's sit back on this one and go for that. And of course, then the pandemic taught us so much, right? There, You just had to respond to the immediate what was immediately in front of you and that was changing every day and and speaking of the pandemic you became president and ceo of mental health america a little more than a year ago in the midst of the pandemic what's your first year at the helm been like uh, what did you hope to achieve and what do you hope to achieve going forward well i've had a terrific first year at mental health america this is certainly not an easy time to join while we have a looming national mental health crisis, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to lead in, in this space. And I'm very fortunate to succeed a leader at MHA who left the organization in extremely strong standing and passed the baton in the most graceful of ways. And I'm equally fortunate to be working with really extremely passionate and talented colleagues, both on the board and on the staff and throughout the our network of national collaborators and um, peers. And just by way of orientation to say Mental Health America or MHA, as we call it, um, has a national office where we do federal public policy work, state and local advocacy, research, public education. And we do this in concert with 143 Mental Health America affiliate sites around the country. And those are the real boots on the ground. So what we learn from the network informs our work at the national office, and then we in turn provide back support through research reports, policy and advocacy work, and other resources to help power those local community-based missions. And that's really a joy for me because it's like, I think of it in some ways like lots of N Street villages around the country that we get to um, support from the national office. Um, and one of our signature programs of the national office, which speaks to a commitment that MHA has long had, which is about uh, commitment to prevention and looking upstream uh, at solutions, is we have a screening and early identification program. So free anonymous online screening for mental health and about 15,000 people every day are now coming to take screens. This is a dramatic increase since pre-pandemic times. And it, it gives us a tremendous amount of data to work with and data that we can drive down to a granular level. So it's important for local advocates and policymakers. So, um, and also we, in conjunction with that, we started in 2016 a screening to supports program, which was really kind of an early prototype for the digital therapeutics that are now becoming much more common. So that people who come to screen then get assistance navigating to either in-person help or other resources that they might want. So going forward um, in this time of crisis, as we recover nationally from collective trauma, collective distress, um, I believe we have a need and an opportunity. Maybe this is what we were talking about a minute ago when you find that sort of sweet spot of need and opportunity to evolve the field and to start thinking about things uh, in some new and different ways. I actually think MHA sort of has a leg up on this and being so committed to upstream thinking. Um, so I, for one thing, we have, I think we have to keep public attention focused to continue these, um, the advancements that we're making, especially against stigma. Um, 
one of that part of that evolution when you ask about where I hope things will go is that even starting fundamentally with how we think about mental health. So we talk a lot about the mental health system. And I think that's an inaccurate, at least inaccurate language. It, it doesn't exist as a monolithic system. It's quite fractured and we don't really have a coordinated national strategy. Um, and as my board member, Karis Myrick says, people don't live in systems, they live in communities. So I think system language is depersonalizing and, and also that it relegates us to an illness-based or a pathology-based lens, which in the end is not going to serve us well and has not served us well, especially if we want to be emphasizing prevention and the promotion of well-being, the promotion of resilience and protective factors and whole person health and, and, and well-being. Um, so getting away from that pathological lens is one of the things that I hope we will do. When, but this will require us to really believe, the, the big us, uh, to really believe that mental health is health and that we should approach the issue with that perspective and that um, perhaps this is where maybe that need and opportunity is coming together. The, the trauma and distress of the past two years is going to provide us an opportunity for, um, for advancing these concepts or new ways of thinking. There's no doubt that you've taken on this role during a particularly challenging time for our country, even outside the pandemic. You were mentioning before that MHA, Mental Health America, does very comprehensive research on what this crisis looks like uh, and its effect on mental health. Could you talk a little bit more? For example, you, you mentioned the surveys that now 15,000 people a day are, 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 are participating in. And I've read that uh, a significant portion of the people participating and, filling, and completing these surveys are young people, uh, people under the age of 17. Can you talk about how um, the pandemic crisis, the, the other crises in our world today are affecting demographic groups in different ways and what MHA is thinking about in terms of uh, interventions and programs that can address differential needs according to the life cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. well, there's, you mentioned our screening program and one of the things that has been really valuable about that, not just for us, but also for our, our partners and collaborators is that it was a source of real-time information. As you know, a lot of the federal data sets about health don't get released until two years later. So right. we were getting real-time information about what was happening to the population during the pandemic. And important to say that no doubt we had a pre-existing mental health crisis in the country prior to, to 2020. Um, rates of depression and suicidality had been on the rise. The opioid crisis was um, on the rise. And the past two years have most certainly put those who were already struggling at greater risk. Um, and then part of the big story is that there's also been a dramatic decline in, in our, our mental health writ large. We've all experienced some degree of at least depletion of our resiliency, if not more significant trauma or crisis. So our data, <clears throat> what our data are showing, in the past year we had about five and a half million people come take one of our mental health screens on our free anonymous site. And the, as I mentioned before, use of those screens went up, it was over 600% during the pandemic. And the number of people reporting thoughts of suicide or self-harm is higher than we have ever seen since the program launched in 2014. And overall, <clears throat> pardon me, 76% um, of the people seeking help in, in the uh, screening program scored with moderate to severe risk for any mental health condition. 76%, that's pretty significant. But the five alarm fire is really with youth. The, they are, that's where we see a tremendous struggling. About almost half, 45% of the people who <clears throat> came to screen themselves were ages 11 to 17. And a little over half of them, 51%, say that they're thinking about suicide more than half the time. So 
half of the, the 11 to 17 year olds are thinking about suicide more than half the days. This is tremendously worrying, obviously. And it's especially true for those who, there are, screeners can leave optional demographics. It's not required, but we do have some demographic information. So we know that this is especially true for those who identify, those youth who identify as black, multiracial, biracial, or LGBTQ. Um, so we, when you asked about the pandemic and we think about youth, we, we consider there are so many things that are affecting the social conditions for youth right now, but just specific to the pandemic, think about all the disruptions to their daily work and school and family life and all the missed developmental milestones. Um, this is, and, and fears and worries, they don't have the same ability to process anxiety in, in the way that we do or information about the pandemic, or they may be worried about caretakers or they may have gotten sick themselves. It, there are any number of reasons why uh, youth would, um, you know, have, have been affected by the pandemic, certainly. And as, as you pointed out, we once again see the role that, that demographic factors and, and social determinants play in, uh, in health writ large, but in particular in mental health. What, what other themes regarding the social determinants of health have you gleaned from the surveys and the research you're doing? And how might that research uh, drive uh, policymakers or, or, or nonprofit leaders like you in terms of the, the programs or, or just the various MHA sites around the country in terms of how they do outreach? Yeah. Well, I, for one thing, it's important to say, first of all, that our 143 affiliates around the country are very focused on the social determinants of mental health. They, they can't not be. I, I just, I recently was in Oklahoma with our affiliate and there they have programs that are for people who have mental illness and are homeless and they've got very creative outreach programs. They have a, an alternative to panhandling program where they um, pick people up in a bus in the morning and offer them a job for the day for $65 cleaning up some of the public parks. And at lunchtime, they serve a lunch meal and they have conversation with case managers and others who are available to provide resources and support to them to get them hopefully moving toward housing and stability. So we've got lots of on the ground solutions that are that are already at play, and I think part of our job is to elevate those um, and and lift up some of these uh, creative solutions. Um, we've we've been talking a lot about social determinants, but I I think again here, if we really, when we really incorporate that concept, it's there's an obvious impulse to take a true public health approach and to prioritize prevention. Um, at a population level, because at the end of the day, this, this is not only the more humane approach, but it's also more cost effective and uh, to go upstream rather than, than having to work downstream where people are um, in more critical um, condition. Absolutely. One welcome shift that we're seeing, and, and you mentioned it before, is that we're beginning to see that people are more willing to openly discuss their mental health and their mental health challenges. What effect do you think this is having on our country's overall conversation about mental health? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think and I hope that we have made a permanent leap forward with regard to stigma. That doesn't mean we've reached the end, but I do think we have taken a bite out of stigma um, in the past couple of years. We've had so many public figures acknowledging their own personal mental health challenges. And I'm so grateful for their willingness to be visible champions and to help us normalize the experience and embrace our mental health as, as fundamental health. Um, I also hope that we've made a leap forward in understanding the connection between our social conditions and our, and our mental health even just on, on this level, because we all saw what it did, what lockdowns and the disruptions of the public health emergency did to us, not to mention all of the other 
points of fragility and conflict and discord in our country right now, from racial reckoning to basic safety to civil liberties and rights. I mean, there's been so much that's been unsettling for people. And so if we look at what that's, um, how that has had an impact on all of us, I hope that it will, that will make a bit more obvious the connection to um, our social conditions. However, I do think we, we still have a long way to go with regard to stigma, especially, and I want to make sure to say this, especially, I think, for certain mental health conditions. So for instance, I believe substance abuse carries more stigma and bias than, say, depression. I really believe we reserve some of our deepest stigma for substance use issues. Um, but depression still carries more stigma and bias than any physical ailment. So we're not yet at that point where we've really embraced mental health as part of our primary health. But I do think we've, we've taken a, a big leap forward. Well, we've talked a lot about the big picture today, but of course, mental health is very personal to each of us. You've spoken out, for example, encouraging people to take mental health days at work uh, when needed for their overall well-being. And what do you think is most important for individuals to do to keep themselves mentally healthy and resilient? The great question. And first and foremost, I would say I encourage self-compassion. As someone who knows the recipe for what the things to do to be protective of one's mental health and and as someone who also knows that I haven't always been able to adhere to them I know that approaching ourselves with compassion and without judgment and surrounding ourselves with others who will do the same is really key to our sense of hope and hope itself is an essential ingredient um, on the road to resilience and well-being Beyond that, I recommend that everyone have basic mental health literacy to understand what are protective factors, to be alert for any early concerns, and to promote one's own resilience by embracing those protective factors like maintaining strong, positive social connections, practicing good self-care, whether that's exercise, nutrition, um, meditation, whatever it is that you do for you, and it can be very personalized. Um, and then also getting connected to the mental health resources or providers that can meet you where you are. And I mean that both, both in the sense of them, uh, uh, the right culturally responsive fit and the right clinical services when, when that someone needs. Um, that question is harder to answer if we were talking about social conditions where root causes of mental health distress could be things like uh, poverty or racial trauma. So that's where advocacy comes in. And service is one of the protective factors for our own uh, mental health and well-being. So if that's of interest to, to people, that getting becoming active in service somehow is a good thing to do to, for your own wellness. You've been a lifelong social justice activist. Early in the pandemic, you wrote an article in LinkedIn that very movingly demonstrated why it's important for people to stand up and take responsibility for creating the world they want to live in. What's your advice for people who want to make a difference but aren't sure how to start? I, I first of all, celebrate the fact that you want to do something. Celebrate the fact of your own motivation. I think that's to be celebrated and we all should and then start where you are start with yourself no cause is too small we are due for an evolution of our social compact and i don't think you have to be making grand gestures to participate in that i have a friend who has been baking fresh bread every week for her neighbors who lost their child to suicide over a year ago and of course you know we've had a lot of youth suicide recently. Um, but this small gesture is, is so meaningful and we can all be neighbors to one another in, in some way, no matter our uh, perspectives or our, our sameness or difference. Um, and to be an advocate on a larger scale, I would say first start, the, the, or start or continue your learning journey. I like to hope that we are on a collective learning journey nationally. I, I think we are. I hope we are with 
you take the interest in books like White Fragility and Cast and a, a whole bunch of things that I know um, my friends and family and their book clubs are, are all reading, and much more explicit discussion about our racial and socioeconomic divisions. I think this is a sign of the evolution that we need. So people can be advocates from wherever you are, and maybe it is just starting with your book club and suggesting that you read Cast or, um, uh, or or whether it's organizing a community action or whatever. But start where you are. Nothing is too small. Lastly, Stroider, there are two questions I like to ask all my guests because they all the guests have, like yourself, led such successful careers as leaders. First, what do you think are the most important qualities in a leader today? Um, I can tell you what I think has been most important to me and the qualities that I have most admired and learned from in my mentors. I think I would say first that it's important to stay humble and to stay teachable. And especially now when we're in such changing and tumultuous times, I think for any of us to say we know exactly what to do or how to innovate to put things back together would be um, wrongheaded. Um, so stay, stay humble, stay teachable. Additionally, I would say it's been important to me to cultivate strong emotional intelligence and to be authentic, to be real, to be um, passionate and to share my enthusiasm and passion and to share my hope. I think that's part of the, the job of a leader is to, is to share that um, sense of possibility and hope and to be highly um, collaborative. I, I, again, nothing is, nothing is done in isolation. So I really believe in, and the, and the basis of all collaboration is relationships. So back to emotional intelligence. The last thing I would say is I think it's really, for me, it's been really important to be willing to risk fear and risk failure when you know that your moral compass is pointed due north. And finally, what gives you hope for the future? Um, well, this may not initially sound optimistic, but I, I do think that the upheaval and disruption of our times is going to force us, I hope, into a new social compact, necessity being the mother of invention, that is. The disruptions in, in every sphere of our lives, from education to healthcare, to the new workplace, I think it's an invitation for us to zero base our imagination for what's possible and for how we can create newly equitable systems and structures that offer everyone the opportunity to flourish. So that's the optimistic vision that I'm holding on to, um, but it will require us to make certain decisions and, and take certain actions as a society. And I must admit, I do have some fear that but we, might, we may not make the best choices, but um, I, nonetheless, I'm holding on to that hope for the next generations. Um, and I just wanna add one thing about hope though, because I feel like I have an evidence basis for it in my life that is unique and I like to share it, which is that I go back to the, the, the very beginning when I was talking about the formative experiences that I had that were somewhat traumatic in my life, but that led me ultimately to the, the path that I've taken. And I think about my father's life and the social conditions of being gay in his, where he grew up, the years, that, the time that he grew up, the, how, just how deleterious it was to his mental health to live in the kind of shame and secrecy that he did as a gay man. And just one generation later, and my life as an openly queer person has spanned the history from Stonewall to gay marriage. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary speed of progress. So I think I have some evidence basis for hope that progress does happen. I do not, this is not to say we don't have a long way to go on this and there's a lot to worry about right now with a new wave of anti-gay and anti-trans sentiment and legislation. Nonetheless, from Stonewall to gay marriage is, is progress. And um, I, 
believe and hope it can happen for in other ways too. Thank you so much, Schroeder. And thank you for listening to the Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's insightful discussion with CEO and President of Mental Health America, Schroeder Stribling. Keep watching and keep learning with me as we continue to look at leadership during a once in a generation crisis. Please send your questions by email to theminorconsult at theminorconsult.com and check out the website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.